Joe's, I'll just uh, make a brief introduction. Uh, he, I found from his web page that he began as a math school teacher in Ghana, and uh, then he went on to do his PhD uh, with Albert Mayer and uh, Gerald Sachs. And since then, he has been at uh, IBM Research, at Stanford, and at Cornell. And he's visited a lot of other places. Uh, among the many honors that he has received, uh, one was the Godel Prize way back in 1997, uh, then the, the Newell Award in 2008, the Dijkstra Award in 2009, so these are all in different areas. So he's worked in areas like distributed computing, he's worked in logic, he's worked in philosophy. Actually, if you look at his web page, you'll find a description of how he describes himself to an audience. So I'll leave you to look that up. Uh, today he's going to talk about game theory, where uh, Nash equilibrium has been a very standard concept. And he's going to talk about what lies beyond Nash equilibrium in the 21st century. Yes. OK. so. Um I'm slightly jet lagged, which will probably slow me down a bit. But if you want to slow me down even more, feel free to ask questions. Don't be polite. Don't, don't wait till the end of the talk. Um, so this is really going to be a summary of, well, originally it was going to be three papers. My guess is it'll only be two papers or two lines of research given the time constraints. But let's see how it goes. Uh, they're quite disjoint. So if you fall asleep in the first part, you can wake up in the second part. Uh, so let me, I, I'm going to assume that this audience doesn't know anything about game theory. It would be nice if you did. Uh, so game theory looks at, at, at games, but games think of them as strategic in, interactions. So beyond chess and poker, we want to think of bargaining, for example, as a game. Um, any interaction where, where I'm thinking, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? What should I do? What will you do if I do that? This kind of strategic reasoning, that's the subject of game theory. And game theorists focus on what they call solution concepts. Well, they claim predictions on how the, the game will be played. And perhaps the most famous solution concept is Nash equilibrium, which was invented by John Nash. It was part of his PhD thesis in the 50s. He got the Nobel Prize for it. Those of you who have seen the movie A Beautiful Mind, that, that's the John Nash. Uh, so roughly speaking, and Nash equilibrium is a strategy profile. When I use the word profile, I mean one strategy for each of the players. And it's an equilibrium. Technically, it's a fixed point. The intuition is that we each follow our strategy, and we're in equilibrium. If nobody can do better by changing their strategy, given what everybody else is doing. So imagine that you know what everybody else is doing. Even knowing what everybody else is doing, you have no temptation to change what you're doing. You're not going to improve your situation by changing what you're doing. Now, I should stress, the Nash equilibrium is not necessarily a happy state of affairs. You might be very unhappy to find yourself in a Nash equilibrium. It's just that you can't individually do anything about it. You can't make yourself better off by changing your strategy. So it's, in, in a precise sense, it really is a fixed point. For mathematicians in the audience, Nash proved the existence of Nash equilibria by using Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So, uh, so as I said, Nash proved that every finite game has a Nash equilibrium if we allow mixing, if we allow randomization. Uh, again, for mathematicians, the randomization gives you some continuity so you can apply fixed point theorems. So when I say randomization, I'm allowed to use a strategy that says with probability a half I'll go left, with probability a half I'll go right. Now, yeah. Nash equilibrium in some situations predicts very well what people do. This seems to work particularly well in, in the biology setting. And as I said, it's good that, that every game has a Nash equilibrium. But there's lots of well-known problems with Nash. Uh, in some games, it gives extremely unreasonable answers. And one example that I'll come back to is Repeated Prisoner's Dilemma. But there are lots of other problems. So we're about to start playing a game. Well. Nash equilibrium says it's a situation where nobody does better given what everybody else is doing. But I have no idea what you're doing. Right? We're playing the game for the first time. I've never met any of you. How do I know what you're doing? So in general, a game can have multiple Nash equilibria. So even if I'm a game theorist and believe that ultimately we'll end up in a Nash equilibrium, if there are many at Nash equilibria, how am I supposed to know which one we're going to play? I've never played the game before, right? 
why would an agent assume that other players are going to, in fact, play their part of a Nash equilibrium? It's not necessarily a good thing to play a Nash equilibrium. So, look, game theorists are well aware of these problems. And in the game theory literature, there have been, probably at this point, hundreds of alternative solution concepts, some of which are refinements of Nash equilibrium. By refinement, I mean that every one of the instances of these solution concepts is a Nash equilibrium, but they sort of cut out some Nash equilibria. Some of them are just different. Uh, here are a bunch of names. Don't even try to memorize them, because I'm not going to use them at all in the talk, uh, because none of them address the situations I want to focus on. So the situations I'm interested in are inspired by computer science, although they could perfectly well have been done by game theorists two decades ago. They don't need computer science in any deep sense. Uh, but so one topic I want to look at generally is, is that Nash equilibrium isn't robust. So roughly speaking, Nash equilibrium assumes that everybody is rational. Why should I assume that everybody is rational? Why is that reasonable? Um, so I want to talk about dealing with faulty or unexpected behavior. Uh, Nash equilibrium doesn't deal with coalitions. So remember when I said uh, a, a strategy profile is Nash equilibrium, if no individual player can do better by deviating. But it's perfectly consistent that you have a Nash equilibrium and Kamal and I could get together, and I say, Kamal, look, we're friends. Let's both deviate. And we could both do much better, right? So a Nash equilibrium says no individual can do better. It says nothing about a coalition of players getting together. Perhaps they can do much better. A Nash equilibrium doesn't take computation into account at all. And I'll make that precise later. And obviously, you know, people are computationally limited. How can we deal with that? Nash equilibrium assumes that the game is common knowledge. By that, I mean that everybody knows that you can move left. Everybody knows everybody knows that, and everybody knows everybody knows everybody knows that. Well, of course, in real life, games aren't necessarily common knowledge. Uh, when terrorists flew a plane into the World Trade Center, think of that as a move in a game. But unfortunately, not everybody was aware that that was a possible move in the game. Now, some people were. Some people had warned about things like that before. Uh, to take perhaps a less politically correct example, um, think of the Americans uh, setting off an atomic bomb in World War II. Right? Again, that was a move in the game, and certainly many in Japan were not aware that that was a possible move in the game. Then the Americans did it again. Um, there were two atomic bombs, right? And you could argue that setting off the second atomic bomb was to make the Japanese aware that not only did they have an atomic bomb, but they were prepared to make that move. Right? So it, it, it was a real move in the game. Uh, so again, what do we do if the game is not common knowledge? Nash equilibrium doesn't make sense if the game isn't common knowledge, because it presumes you understand the strategies of the other players. Well, if the game isn't common knowledge, and you don't know what moves the other player can make, you surely don't understand what strategies they can use. So likewise, Nash equilibrium implicitly assumes the players know, or at least have correct beliefs about other players' strategies. What if they don't? What if I have no clue of what you're doing? Now, I could be a good Bayesian and, and, and make up beliefs, but I don't trust my beliefs. So let me start addressing some of these issues. I, won't, I almost surely won't get to all of them, given the time constraints, if we're going to have lunch today. Um, but let me start by dealing with fault tolerance and, and coalitions. So as I said, Nash equilibrium tolerates deviations by a single player, certainly not much of a stretch to, to think about having coalitions. So let me give you an example. Um, so suppose we're n players, we're all playing a game. There's only two possible moves. You can play either 0 or play 1. If everybody plays 0, then we all get a payoff of 1. If exactly two of us play 1, say Kamal and I play 1, then the two of us get a payoff of 2, and everybody else gets 0. And in any other situation, everybody gets 0. Okay. So I claim that everybody playing 0 is a Nash equilibrium. If we all play 0, we all get a payoff of 1. And no single person is tempted to deviate, because if anybody deviates, then we all get 0. We're into that third bullet, the otherwise clause. But if Kamal and I deviate, and I say, Kamal, Kamal, let's both play 1, then we're happy. The two of us are the only players playing 1. We get 2. And all the rest of you get zero. I don't care about that, but I care about the fact 
that I'm getting two rather than one. Right? So everybody playing zero is a Nash equilibrium. No single person is tempted to deviate. But it's not what we're going to call a two resilient equilibrium because a coalition of two can do better by deviating. Does that make sense? So it's not like economists haven't thought about this. In fact, um, so I, of course, Nash equilibrium is just a one resilient equilibrium. Uh, but in general, k resilient equilibria don't exist if k is greater than one. It's not that hard to come up with counterexamples, even if, even if k equals two. Now, Alman, Bob Alman, who won a Nobel Prize, already considered a resilient equilibrium back in 1959. So as I say, this is certainly not a new idea over 50 years ago. And in fact, he defined a notion called strong equilibrium, which is k resilient for all k. Now, as I say, the trouble is that, that k resilient equilibria in general don't exist. And my sociological view of economists is that they're extremely reluctant to look at solution concepts that they can't prove in general exist. Because then they don't know how to apply the solution. You know, you're given a game. The solution concept might not exist. It certainly does, has no predictive power if it doesn't exist. You can't say this is the way the players will play if there's no way the players could do that. Nevertheless, I claim it's interesting to look at these things, but I want to look beyond k resilience. So let me tell you where uh, I'm going. I, I want to take into account resilience and coalitions, but I want to go beyond that. So I want to take into account possibly, let me say, irrational players, although I don't necessarily mean that they're irrational. Um, so let me give you some examples of, of what I have in mind. Well, maybe the, the best example is, is um, um, I teach a large discrete math class quite often, and I tell my students they should all do their homework. You would be irrational not to do your homework, because if you do your homework, it counts for 25% of the grade. Easy 25%. You shouldn't pass up on that. Plus, if you do your homework, you'll do much better on, on the exam, because you'll learn the material, right? So, of course, all rational students should do their homework. And of course, every year I find uh, some small number of students don't do their homework quite consistently. Right? Um, now, you could argue that my students are irrational. And, and indeed, at times, I believe that they're irrational. Um, uh, but you could also say, look, they just have different utilities from what I expect. They had a party that they could go to. And when it came to a choice between going to the party and doing my homework, they quite rationally decided that going to the party would be much more fun and to hell with getting a higher grade. Uh, so it's just me not totally understanding their utilities. Now, those of you who are parents uh, are well aware that kids seem to have utility functions that don't always appear to be totally rational. Uh, but you could say you just don't quite understand. And indeed, as a parent, I clearly don't always quite understand what my kids are going through. Um, but maybe they're irrational. But given my motivation, if you're playing a large game, it's quite possible that, that some players will have faulty computers. So that even if they are perfectly rational, if we're playing the game over the internet, think of bidding on eBay, for example, then they just can't get their computer to do what they want it to do. Their computer is being flaky. Um, or if you think of my mother bidding on eBay, even if you assume she's rational and knows what she wants to do, she doesn't know how to use the computer. So she can't get it to do what she wants it to do, even if her computer is working perfectly well. So it seems to me quite reasonable to look at, at especially if you're looking at large games, to think about irrational players. Now I should point out that such irrational behavior, apparently irrational behavior, is not so uncommon. So I, I imagine many of you have heard of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks. Think of BitTorrent, Nutella, Kazaa. Um, now you might say, well, um, why? I, I can understand why you'd want to download mu music and movies. But why should you post music and movies? Right? Because in the United States, people who posted uh, music, for example, or movies were in danger of getting sued by the RIAA. You certainly don't want to get sued. That can cost you serious money. And even if you're not going to get sued, Somebody downloading a bunch of stuff off of your server will tie up your server and, and, and you know, cause other applications you have running to slow down. So why would anybody bother seeding? Why would anybody bother posting material? Again, I can totally understand why people would want to download from other people. But why would you post things on the web? That seems irrational. But hey, maybe, I don't, maybe you like the idea of going around the campus and saying, you know, all that music you downloaded, I was the one who posted it, right? Um, People just have different utility functions. Now, in fact, they've done studies, and they find that, that almost all the material on file sharing sites is posted by about 3%, 3 to 5% of the people. So you could say most people are irrational, uh, irrational and the rest, 
Either they're irrational, they just have different utility functions. But my point is that if you're going to analyze a large game, you should take into account such apparent irrationalities. Uh, you can't assume that everybody's behaving, quote, rationally. So let me give you an example. I want to distinguish resilience from, from irrationality. So consider a group of end bargaining agents, again, us. Now, if we all stay in bargain, we get two. Two is the best possible payoff. Anybody who goes home gets one. And anybody who stays, if somebody goes home, gets zero. You're a sucker if you stay. Okay? Now, I claim this game has two equilibria. So quick sanity check, what are the two equilibria in this game? Somebody? What are the two equilibria? Everybody stays. That's an equilibrium. And that gives you the best possible payoff of two. There's another equilibrium. Everybody goes home. Well. Um, if you're playing a game with 100,000 people, are you going to stay? Are you going to count on everybody else staying? Right. So I'm going to say that, if, let me point out that everybody staying is a K resilient equilibrium for all K. No group of size K for any K has any incentive to deviate, because if you all stay, you get a payoff of two, and that's the best possible payoff. You can't do better by deviating. right? On the other hand, it's not a very, let me use the word, robust equilibrium. All it takes is one irrational player to go home, and all the suckers who stayed get zero. Right? So it seems to me quite reasonable. I, again, I should say that our motivation for this, so let me give you a little bit of history, because uh, it'll come up, um, is, well, OK. Uh, this is somewhat like work in Byzantine agreement, distributed computing. Those of you familiar with that. So distributed computing looks at the problem of reaching agreement in the presence of faulty agents. So let me say a little bit about, about sociology and history. So if you stand back a few yards or a few meters, depending on where you're from, uh, the work in distributed computing and work in game theory really are very close. Both of them look at interactions with large groups of agents. OK, game theory tends to focus on humans. Distributed computing tends to focus on computers. But nevertheless, it's interactions among a large group of agents. And both are concerned with deviant behavior. In the case of game theory, the assumption is that everybody is rational, and you're deviating. A deviation would be irrational. You would hope in an equilibrium that no rational agent would, would deviate. In the case of distributed computing, the, you know, these are computers after all. Rational and irrational were not words that were tended to be applied to computers. The focus was on fault tolerance. So the idea was we want an algorithm that will tolerate a number of computers failing, crashing, or being worse than crashing, you know, doing arbitrary bad things. Right? So again, they were looking for protocols, think strategies that would ensure certain kinds of behavior. But there the focus in, in, in distributed computing, the focus was on fault tolerance. Uh, a large chunk of my research, at least this line of my research, has been involved in some sense marrying the two fields together, combining ideas of fault tolerance from distributed computing with ideas of rationality from, from game theory. Now, uh, I'm going to say a protocol is KT robust if it tolerates coalitions of size K and is T immune. And by T immune, I, I mean it tolerates up to T irrational agents. I'll omit the formal definition. But it's, it's sort of in the spirit of the definition of Nash equilibrium. Nash equilibrium is a special case of 1-0 robustness. And in general, KT robust equilibria don't exist. But they can be obtained with the help of mediators. So let me explain the concept of mediators, because this allows me to talk about some wonderful history. Uh, so consider an auction. So you're trying to do an auction, let's say, on, on, on the rights to drill for oil offshore in some, company, in some country, and in general, you know, one way of doing this is by having a public auction, but companies don't want to reveal how much they're willing to bid to drill, right? I mean, revealing your bid, that reveals some privileged information. You might have had your team of geologists checking out the situation, and you don't want to tell other companies your bid will reveal to other companies what, effectively what your geologists found, right? How, how likely there is to be oil there, you don't want to reveal that. Or, or you don't want to reveal your general strategy. Are you aggressively trying to buy up contracts for the right to drill? That will tell other companies about you know, your, your strategic plans. You don't want to reveal that. So what do people do? Well, they, they assume that we have a trusted third party, and we're going to give our bids to the trusted third party. The trusted third party will announce the winner, but won't reveal what the bids are. And which is fine if you have a trusted third party. 
uh, what happens if you don't have a trusted third party. So there's been work, it turns out, in both computer science and economics uh, on getting rid of the trusted third party, implementing mediators. So again, the problem is if we can do something with a trusted third party, can we do it without a trusted third party? So if you Google cheap talk, you'll find hundreds of papers in the economics literature on cheap talk. And, and basically the idea is there, if we can get a certain Nash equilibrium with a trusted third party. So the picture is, we're playing a game, it's a standard game theory. Uh, we all tell the trusted third party what we're willing to bid. We can lie, right? This is game theory. And we get some kind of an outcome or some distribution over outcomes. In general, in Nash equilibrium, uh, we allow randomized strategies, so we get a distribution over outcomes. And the question is, in the game, where you're just talking to each other, and it's cheap talk because I can tell you, look, I promise if you do this, I'll do that, but hey, cheap talk. I could be lying, right? So the question is, with just, just using cheap talk in the game, technically in the communication game that you get using cheap talk, can you get the same outcome? So technically, can you get a Nash equilibrium, equilibrium with the same distribution over outcomes as you could with the mediator? That's what it means to implement a mediator. So can you get a Nash equilibrium in the communication game that has the same distribution over outcomes as your Nash equilibrium in the game with the, with the mediator? So economists looked at that. And I should say the economists looked at it include people like Roger Meyerson, who won a Nobel Prize, Francois Fauge, extremely well-known economists. That's what you should get out of this. Um, and they showed that, yes, indeed, you could implement a mediator if you had sufficiently many players, depending on what you wanted. They, they could show that, that with four players, you could implement a mediator. Now, there's also work in computer science. Now, it's interesting, the work by, by Myerson and Forge goes back to the late 80s, around 88 or 89. There's work in computer science on what's called multi-party computation. And again, it, what's the problem of multi-party computation? If you can achieve a certain result with the mediator, can you achieve it without the mediator? Seems like the same problem. The only difference is that, that in the multi-party communication literature, the focus was on fault tolerance. If you can achieve a certain result with a trusted third party, can you achieve it without a trusted third party just by communicating if even up to a third or a half of the players are faulty? So the, Computer science literature was, was coming out of the Byzantine agreement world of trying to achieve agreement among players even though there were faulty players. So this is the distributed computing model. And indeed it was shown that you could achieve multi, you could do multi-party computation and the people who showed it were again very famous figures in computer science, Mickey ben Orr, Shafi Goldwasser, Odette Goldreich, Silvio McCauley, Avi Vigdorsson. So Silvio and Shafi, for example, are at MIT. Avi is at the Institute for Advanced Science at Princeton, IAS associated with Princeton, these are not obscure people, right? So that's my point. Neither in economics nor in computer science were, were the people doing this, you know, these, these are major figures in the field. And also in computer science, the work goes back to 1988, 89. There was a paper, I think it was in 1988, published by Macaulay, Goldwasser, and Vigdorsson called How to Play Any Mental Game. Now at the time, Silvio Macaulay did not know any game theory. Now he's actively working in game theory. Uh, so when they, they had rather naive models of playing a game, but nevertheless, the idea was um, in a mental game, could you play poker just by talking to yourselves? With, you know, uh, but poker, where we're, we're distributed poker, where I'm in Ithaca, New York, and you're in, in Chennai, India, just over the telephone, could you play poker? Right? So, uh, well, obviously, if you had a trusted third party, uh, you could do it. Could you do it without the third party? And they showed that, that under certain assumptions that you could. A lot of this work involved um, crypt cryptographic ideas. What's really interesting, so again, both of these lectures go back to the late 80s. Um, it turns out that the results in computer science, some of them subsume the results in economics, although people didn't realize that until we came on the scene 27 years later. Um, in particular, what's, I said in economics, um, they showed they could implement Nash equilibrium with four players. What's important about four? Four is three times one plus one. Um, because as, as I'll show you, that, that in general, you can, uh, if you have up to T faulty players, you can, there are results in the, the CS literature that say um, you can do multi-party computation with up to T faulty players if you have at least three T plus one players. Uh, and it turns out, and this is not obvious, but, but we can view the, the computer science result as a, uh, the economics result as a special case of this, where t is one, so four is three times one plus one. That's, that's the magic. Um, turns out you can do error correction with it. I'll, I'll explain that if I get a chance. So let me give you a sense of the kind of results that we get. Um, 
So these really are results that, that, that generalize results in both economics and computer science. So again, our general question is, if you can get a KT robust equilibrium with the mediator. So it, it turns out in many cases, if you have a trusted third party, although in general KT robust equilibria don't exist, you can get them. So again, let me remind you, KT robust says it's an equilibrium where you can tolerate coalitions up to size K. K is a parameter. And you can tolerate up to T irrational players. So at an equilibrium where I'm not hurt if up to T players do something arbitrary, and no K players can deviate and do better. So I should, again, stress the difference between the coalitions and, and the faulty players. With coalitions, it's saying you can't do better by deviating. So the people who deviate can't do better. When I talk about the irrational players, I don't have any sense for their, their, their utilities. It's that the people who don't deviate don't suffer because of irrational players. So coalitions focuses on the utilities of the rational deviators, and, and robustness focuses on the utility of the hopefully rational non-deviators. It says they don't suffer because of deviation. Um, and so one result that we get, which actually turns out to be a generalization of, of a, a fairly simple generalization of result in the computer science literature says, uh, if you have a KT robust equilibrium with the mediator, you can get rid of the mediator with cheap talk, as long as you have at least 3K plus 3T players. So you need sort of, to get, to achieve this, you need sort of triple the number of, of deviators and, and, and coalitions you want to tolerate. Um, and the nice thing about this protocol is I don't need to know anything about the agent's utilities. Um, and the protocol has a bounded running time that doesn't depend on the utilities. So it'll stop after 17 steps, or some number of steps. It depends on the game but not on the details of the utilities. And this bound is tight. You can't do it if n is less than or equal to 3k plus 3t. I should explain what I mean by that. It's an existential result. There exists a game with 3k plus 3t players, and in that game there's an equilibrium I can achieve with the mediator, and I can't do it without the mediator. So now it could be games, other games, there are other games where, where I have n less than 3k plus 3t, where I can implement the meteor. So when I, when I say this is a lower bound, I say you can't get a general result if n is less than or equal to 3k plus 3t. Right? Um, the next result says, suppose now n is greater than 2k plus 3t. So what's happened is I've changed the 3 to a 2. And now I need to know the agent's utilities. I need to know what makes them tick because I'm also going to assume I have what I call a punishment strategy. I don't call it, actually, this is a notion from the game theory literature. So the idea is, if I catch you deviating, I can punish you. Punish in this case means do something that will give you a worse payoff than what you would have had had you not deviated. Right? So if you do what you're supposed to do, if you play the equilibrium, let's say you'll get a payoff of five. Now, you might be tempted to deviate because you think if you deviate, you can get the payoff of 10. Aha, but if I catch you deviating, then I can make sure you only get a payoff of 3, and you will wish that you hadn't deviated. This is like telling your kids, don't do it. You'll be sorry, right? Now, of course, there's only some probability that I'll catch you deviating, and, and it turns out that I can set that probability high enough to make sure that, that, that you won't be tempted to deviate. And question? Sorry? Deviation from the cheap talk. So the idea is going to be that if I have if I have a strategy that works with the trusted third party, then I can get rid of the trusted third party. I can implement the trusted third party using cheap talk, provided n is greater than 2k plus 3t. But I need to know the agent's utilities, and I need to have this punishment strategy. And again, this bound is tight. So what event was there is the cheap talk. Sorry? You say something, there's the cheap talk. Right. Oh, I see. Uh, it's, it's, it's more complicated than that. So um, the cheap talk doesn't it involve saying much, much more than what you said. The cheap talk will involve uh, sending encryption keys and doing all sorts of things. So it's not the cheap talk is as simple as saying, trust me, I'll go left. Right? Uh, but nevertheless, there's a bunch of things that you have to do. And I'm watching you like a hawk at every step of the way. And maybe, maybe if you don't do what you're supposed to do, I'll catch you not doing it. The kind of thing that you're not supposed to do is to tell different things to different people, it turns out. 
So if I can discover that you haven't said the same, you know, the things you were supposed to say to different people, uh, then I'll punish you. But, but as I say, it's, it's not as simple as the kinds of things you say is, trust me, trust me, I'm going to go left. It, it's more complicated than that. Uh, no, it turns out there's a message space. So what they're doing in, 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 in the communication game is they're sending messages. Now, the set of messages is known and, and can be taken to be finite. It's, still a finite it's a finite space. It can be taken to be a finite and space. Then the decision is made only when everybody announces their choice. Again, it's more complicated than that. So there's a protocol where we're sending each other messages. Uh, at the end of the day, we're making a decision. That's true. Um, at, at, at the end of the protocol, we're, we're making a decision. It turns out that the way we make the decision um, in, involves um, uh, it, it involves finding a zero of a polynomial. So, I mean, the, the f of zero encodes the decision. It turns out so. It was, yes. So, in general, my utility will depend on the whole tuple of choices made, not just mine. Well, you won't necessarily know everybody's, what everybody, you might know what they're supposed to do or what the, they will, I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to compute your choice um, without exactly knowing what everybody else is going to do, but your choice will be your part of the Nash equilibrium. Now, again, this equilibrium might be randomized so that, that what you end up doing, um, you'll end up, you know, playing left with a, probably a third and right with probably two thirds, but, but again, you'll know what you're supposed to do. So if you follow the protocol, you'll be playing your part of the equilibrium. Uh, just a few other results that, that um, if we, up to now, I've assumed we just have point-to-point -point communication. If we have a broadcast facility, you can do better. If n is greater than 2k plus 2t, you can implement the mediator, or you can epsilon implement. You can't quite, there's a small probability of error. Um, and ooh, this is a typo, it should be if n is greater than, not less than or equal to, but if n is greater than, greater than k plus t, if you assume cryptography and polynomially bounded players and a punishment strategy and PKI is a public key infrastructure, if you have all the paraphernalia of cryptography, um, then you can epsilon a mediator using cheap talk, again, as long as n is just bigger than k plus t. But what I want you to get out of this, obviously you're not going to remember all these results, is how standard assumptions of both game theory and distributed computing come in here. So obviously in the last bullet, all these assumptions are standard assumptions polynomially bounded players, public key infrastructure, these are standard assumptions of computer science. Punishment strategy is a standard assumption from game theory. Whether or not you have point-to-point -point communication or broadcast communication, again, that's, a, that's an issue that, that computer scientists look at. Uh, let me comment, just to go back a slide, um, the fact that, that uh, I didn't mention here, but our, our protocol here requires unbounded running time so that it's a randomized protocol it has constant, the, running, the expected running time is constant. So roughly speaking, with probably a half, you're stopping at round one. With probably three quarters, you've stopped by round two. So you're sort of tossing a coin to decide whether or not to stop the protocol, roughly. Um, but we can show that this, so, but so there is no bound, a priori bound on the running time of the protocol, even though it has constant expected time, low constant expected time. Now, the reason I'm making a fuss about that is it turns out that there are published results in major economics journals that purport to solve this problem, but their protocols are bounded. They stop after 17 rounds. Even if you don't understand anything about their protocols, you can just look at it and it says step one, step two, step three, and it's over by step, actually in their case, by step 12. Those protocols are buggy. They're buggy in a serious way because we have an impossibility result that says there cannot be a bounded protocol. Then after we figured out that they had to be buggy, we looked at them and found what the bug was, and it's, it's a quite non-trivial bug, but, but uh, um, and, and the authors agree that they're buggy. So, I think. Uh, it, yes, it terminates in finite time with probability one, and as I say. But, uh, no, and the expected time is finite. It's constant expected time. But there's just no a priori bound on, on the running time. Right? So, I, you can't say that, you can't say with probability one it'll, it'll terminate after 17 rounds. You can certainly say with probably one it'll terminate in finite time. Not all to say it, it's true. Uh, so I, I think the bottom line here is that, that 
you need to take into account solution. You want to take into account solution concepts that take coalitions and fault tolerance seriously. But there are other ideas that, I'll, I'll, well, let me defer to the end. Um, let me switch gears now and just talk about something totally different. So if you found that boring or you fell asleep, now's the time to wake up again. You'll have another chance uh, starting over from square zero. Um, let me talk about costly computation. Sure. Uh, uh, sure. Yeah. No. Nope. There's no rationality assumption. Nope. This, uh, right. On the game theory side, there are rationality assumptions. Uh, only when I talk about, so remember, I'm talking about KT robust protocols. So the K part, the coalitions, I'm assuming the coalitions are, everybody in the coalition is rational. You wouldn't deviate unless you were rational. Uh, in the T part, uh, these are irrational players I, I don't make any assumptions about. As you'll, if, when I write the formal definition, there are no assumptions made about, about their rationality. Uh, so it's not obvious. But in fact, uh, the result, the first result really is, really does follow fairly, well, with, with not that much work from, from a result by Ben Earl Goldwasser and Vigdorsson. Um, so even though their paper didn't talk about rationality at all, at all it nevertheless, it, it, it's not only is it their technique, but, but you can almost, if you do it right, you can use their result as a black box and say, that's good enough. Uh, one more thing. Uh, sure. Can we also show existence for a particular case of A and T? Existence of the equilibrium. So all our results are saying if, the, if there is a protocol with a mediator, there, there is a protocol without a mediator, so they're always relative, um, and, and our proof is constructive. Of course, we give the protocol. Uh, so you're, are you asking, do we know that there exists a protocol with a mediator? That's completely game dependent. So that, that it would be really interesting to say, is there a class of games for which you're guaranteed to have a protocol with a mediator? Great question, and I have no idea. So, um, so I mean, in general, we know it can't be done because we know there's going to be games that don't have any KT robust equilibrium. There couldn't have been a game with a mediator that would give you this, right? Um, but uh, for when it can be done, uh, there's no understanding, I think. No, no generic, un you know, no kind of results to say this, here's a large class of games for which is guaranteed to work. It's a good question. And the punishment is applied both to the uh, irrational guys and to the collaborative. It turns out that the punishment is applied to everybody. And um, so you could say, is this what, what economists call um, a sequential equilibrium? I mean, would a rational player be willing to apply the punishment? With a few extra assumptions, we can even show that, that, that yes, it's rational to apply the punishment. But uh, um, uh, get me at lunch, and I'll, I'll say more about that. OK, so let me switch gears. So the first part was joint work with, with Danny Dole, Vitae Abraham, uh, and part of it with Rike Gonen. Uh, this part is, is, is joint with my colleague, Raphael Pass. Um, so making computation costly. So you're given, a, here's an example of what we have in mind. Uh, you're given an n-bit number. Think of n as like 100 or 150. Uh, you have Three choices, you can guess whether it's prime, you can say it's prime, you can say it's not prime, you can say I pass. Now if you say prime or not prime, uh, if you get the right answer, you get a high payoff, so let me say you get $10, but of course if you get the wrong answer, you get a low payoff, let me say you lose $10, but the numbers don't matter. Uh, the point is if you pass, you can play safe and you can get a dollar no matter what. Now there's exactly one Nash equilibrium in this game, this is a one player game. Uh, there's exactly one Nash equilibrium in this game and that's give the right answer. Because if you're not giving the right answer, you should deviate and give the right answer, right? And, and at this point, you should not be happy. Uh, but never, I mean, so certainly what I'm saying is technically true. But, but of course, uh, in real life, people, you know, I <laughs> give you a 150-digit number of you know, a string of zeros and ones and say, is it prime? And if you, ha if you were playing this game, I would bet that almost all of you would say, uh, I pass, give me my dollar. Right. Yes, for those of you who are going to tell me, yes, I know primalities in polynomial time. Um, and yes, I know there are fast randomized algorithms. I, I know these things, but I'm not carrying around my computer when I play the game. So as far as I'm concerned, testing for primality is a very hard problem. Um, that uh, Clearly what's wrong with this is it's not taking the cost of computing the answer into account. And, and again, I'm not saying anything that economists haven't thought about for a long time. Um, and, and in fact, um, the notion of making computation cost part of the equilibrium um, goes back to Ari Rubinstein in 1985. 
And what we're doing is, in fact, a generalization of what he did. I mean, what he did is he used finite automata. So he assumed the players, instead of actually making a framework, we, we consider what, what economists call Bayesian games. So let me explain. In a Bayesian game, each agent has a type. Think of the type as private information. So your type might say uh, whether you're lazy or industrious. The type is something that you know. So, I mean, a canonical example in, in, in the game theory literature, we have a market where there's a lot of workers who are either lazy or industrious. That's their type. Um, and there's an employer. The workers know whether or not they're lazy or industrious. The employer, given a random worker, doesn't know whether he's lazy or industrious. But it's assumed that there's a commonly known distribution over types. So the employer might know 75% of people are lazy, right? So that, that's known. So he doesn't know about any particular individual, whether they're lazy or, 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 or industrious, but he does know the, the, the probability that a random individual is lazy or industrious. In general, there's, there's a commonly known distribution over types. So in our setting, we have exactly that setting. Um, we assume that agents don't choose a finite automaton, but they choose a Turing machine. Again, even if you're not a computer scientist, it's just a model of computation. The details don't matter. Think of a Turing machine as, as, as a computer algorithm. And associated with each Turing machine, M and type T, that pair, M and T, is its complexity. And the way you should think of complexity is just a measure. It's an abstract measure. It could be, for example, the running time of the Turing machine. So think of the type as the input to the Turing machine. So the complexity of MT could be the running time of the Turing machine on that input. It could be the space used by the Turing machine on that input. It could be the number of random bits used. I, I can charge you for randomizing um, by the Turing machine on that input. It could be input independent, and it could just say, how many states does your Turing machine have? That would be close to the Rubenstein model. So just think of the complexity of MT as just some abstract measure of how much computation is involved in computing the answer when, when Turing machine M is given input T. Okay? Is the type distribution over the agent IID? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, definitely not necessarily. It's just assumed to be whatever it is, it's assumed to be commonly known. Uh, well, so it, it, there can be dependence, right? So this is, what you have are, is the distribution over type profiles. So my type could be correlated with yours. All I'm assuming is that, that the correlation is understood. You know the probability measure on the type space. On the type, so when I say that the, the, the measure on the type space is known, the type space is, is the space of, of profiles of types, tuples. And, and absolutely, I'm allowing dependence. There definitely could be correlation between my type and yours. So it could be that the probability that we're both lazy is, is two-thirds. The probability that we're both industrious is, is, is one-third. But, right, so it's not enough just to know my, my probability and your probability. It, it's, it's really a distribution on, on profiles. Does this have some evolution uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. So it could be that we're perfectly correlated. So that I know that if I'm lazy, you are too. And that if I'm industrious, you are too. Right? I mean, the employer doesn't know that. I take it, I mean, the employer understands the distribution. So he does know that there's perfect correlation. He just doesn't know which we are, whereas, of course, I can make quite strong inferences about your type given my type. Right? That's absolutely a lot. Um, so each agent gets it. So now we play a game, and the game, what's happening is I'm choosing a Turing machine to play for me. That Turing machine gives an output. Think of the output as being my move in the game. So what do we have? We have each agent makes a move in the game, chooses a Turing machine. That, that we have a collection of actions. And your utility depends on the type profile, the action profile, what everybody does, what everybody's like, and the complexity profile. So the only, if you look at a standard Bayesian game in the literature, the only difference is that we now have introduced complexities. So let me just give you an example to give you some intuition. Imagine I'm playing Jeopardy against you. So my type might be how smart I am or how good I am at Jeopardy. So the type can even be a real number in the interval 0, 1. That's OK. Or I could just, it could be discrete. I could be you know, very good, mediocre, whatever. So that's my type. Uh, and plus whatever private information I have. I mean, um, then I choose a Turing machine to play for me. Now, of course, in Jeopardy, what matters 
is A, that you get the right answer, but B, that you get it faster than anybody else, right? So my utility doesn't, will depend in part on whether my output is correct, but it will also depend on, if you think of the complexity as the running time, not just my running time, but how my running time compares to your running time, right? So that's why we need the whole profile of complexities. So now you have to decide in Jeopardy, am I going to choose a Turing machine that's very quick but might give the wrong answer with fairly high probability, or a Turing machine that's slower but will give the right answer? That's exactly the kind of trade-off we want to investigate, right? So does it make sense now that, that of course, now that the utility depends on the running time of the Turing machine? But I'm capturing that by the complexity. That's right. So that's just like a standard Bayesian game. We make a move, and in our case, the move is the output of the Turing machine. And then given that tuple of moves and the tuple of complexities and the types, then we all get our payoff. But it's a, it's a one-shot game. I mean, there's just the one move. It's OK. Uh, come on. I'll, I'll, I'll. It's OK. You can ask questions if, if I decide that we're going over time or, or that I might defer it. Um, so the good news is that, that Adding complexities, I think, does capture important features. In the primality testing game for a large input, you'll play safe because computation is expensive. We can easily model that. We can capture the overhead and switching strategies. For example, I can say, look, I'm going to suggest a strategy that you can use. If you use it, the complexity is zero. If you switch to something else, there's, there's a non-trivial complexity. So there, I'm, I'm, I've just captured, if you like, in a naive way, um, the fact that people are reluctant to, to leave the tried and true because there's search costs. And, we can model search costs. And we can explain some experimentally observed results. I'll, I'll come back to that later. Well, in fact, maybe I'll come to it now. Uh, so repeat over. So how many people have heard of prisoners? How many people have not heard of prisoner's dilemma? All right, let me explain. So prisoner's dilemma is that game captured there. There, there are two prisoners. They can either cooperate or defect. Now, let me explain what cooperation defection means here. So uh, the jailer has captured these two prisoners and says, well, look, you can um, confess to your crimes, um, or you can stay silent. Now, in this case, cooperation means staying silent. Now, if you confess, confess means ratting out in the other guy. Uh, if you confess and the other person stays silent, then I will reward you by, you'll get out of jail, you'll be able to go and dig up your, 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 your buried treasure that, you know, from your last bank robbery, and you never liked your partner anyway, he gets to go to jail. So if you defect, and defect in this, means, in this case means you know, ratting out the other guy, and he cooperates, we're in the, you know, so cooperate, defect, you get five and he gets negative five. Um, likewise, if he defects and you cooperate, he gets five, you get negative five, right? It's symmetric. If you both cooperate, you both get three. If you both defect, you get minus one. That's, that's what this is saying, right? Are we, are we together? Now, the important thing here is defection dominates cooperation. Whatever the other guy does, you're better off defecting than cooperating. That's really easy to see from, from the matrix there. If the other guy cooperates, if he's foolish enough to cooperate and you defect, you'll get five. Whereas if you cooperate, you'll only get three. So if he cooperates, you're certainly better off defecting than cooperating. If he defects, you'd be stupid to cooperate. You get negative five, whereas if he, if he defects and you defect, you get negative one. So no matter what he does, you're better off defecting than cooperating. And so game theory would predict. The only Nash equilibrium is they both defect. Um, and game theory predicts that people defect. And well, people in the one-shot game, yeah, even there, people cooperate. But you might think, suppose we played this game a 1,000 times. Now, even if game theory says, OK, you should defect in the one-shot game, you might hope if you played a 1,000 times, hey, I'm going to show you that I'm a nice guy and I'm going to cooperate for a while that will induce you to cooperate and we'll get some cooperation going. And in fact, in the real world, you do see when you play repeated persons limit, there tends to be an awful lot of cooperation. Now in general, uh, policemen and firemen cooperate far more than lawyers. Uh, women cooperate in general a bit more than men. Apparently they've done thousands of experiments. Um, the worst are economic students. They never cooperate. <laughs> and, you know, but game theory would predict the only Nash equilibrium here is to always defect. And we can prove this by backward induction. 
So you're playing the game a thousand times, think of the last step. The very last step is like a one-shot game. There's no future. There's no point in cooperating at the very end. At the very end, you might as well defect because defection beats cooperation. Are we together? If we're ready, if we're playing a thousand times, we're at the last step. The last step, you might as well defect. It's as if you're playing the game once. There's no tomorrow. Well, if we're both going to defect because we're rational at the last step, now look at the second last step. What's the point in cooperating on the second last step, given that the other guy is going to defect in the last step anyway? So you defect at the second last step. And now you just march back by backward induction. The only equilibrium is you always defect. Another way to think about this, if you're going to cooperate, at what point do you stop cooperating? Right? And it turns out there is, you know, whenever you stop cooperating, you want to stop one step before the other guy. And there's no, there's no fixed point. Right? But as I say, in the real world, one does observe an awful lot of cooperation. Uh, let me give you a simple explanation based on our model. Um, so there's a strategy tit for tat. Tit for tat says, start by cooperating, and then defect as soon as you see the other guy defecting. Right? So I'm going to assume you're a nice guy, I'm going to cooperate. And as long as you're nice, I'm going to be nice. But if you defect, then the next move, I'm going to defect. In fact, let's even make you defect forever. Right? So if you ever deviate, if you ever defect, that's it. No more, I don't trust you anymore, I'm just going to defect. Okay? That's tit for tat. Suppose I'm playing tit for tat, what's your best response? We're doing it a thousand times. I'm playing, I promise you, I've, I've written a program, I'm playing for tit for tat. I went home. I'm playing tit for tat, you know for sure. What's your best response? Sorry? To cooperate all the way? Sorry? Uh, tit for tat, uh, you can do a bit better. If, you, if we both play tit for tat, then we'll, we'll cooperate all the way. That's the effect, because we start out cooperating and then we'll continue cooperating. You can do a bit better than that. So I'm playing tit for tat. How can you maximize your payoff? You do want to cooperate a lot. Uh, somebody? Defect at the last step. You cooperate up to the very end, and then the end, you defect. Because, of course, at that point, it's too late for me to punish you. Right? I'm always one step behind you, but if you're defecting at the very last step, well, I can't punish you tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. Are we together? It's actually not hard to show that, that, that the best response to tit for tat is to defect at the last step. Of course, the best response to somebody defecting at the last step is to defect at the second last step and we're marching backwards. But if you know for sure I'm playing tit for tat, then you should defect the last step. Remember, your only goal is to maximize. It's anonymous. You'll never see me again. So you shouldn't think about concerns like, I'm going to feel bad if you defect. Right? That, that's, that's not supposed to be. This is game theory, right? Um, I mean, that, that's a serious problem, actually. But let's, let's ignore that. Your goal is just to maximize your payoff. You want to feed your children. Right? Um, OK. But now we're playing a thousand times. To defect at the last step, you have to count to a thousand. You have to keep track of what step we're on. You don't want to defect at the third last step, because that, then actually you're worse off. Because then I'll just defect for the last two steps. And, and, and you, know, you, you want to cooperate up to the very end and then defect. But that requires that you count. Now, if I charge you, for, there's lots of ways of doing it here. I have a discount factor. Let's not even worry about that. I mean, all, the only point here is once you, once you understand that, you can say, OK, once I introduce complexity, there is a cost to counting to 1,000. That takes a certain amount of storage, a certain number of states, however you, you choose to model it. Um, right? So playing tit for tat is very simple computationally. All you have to keep track of is what the other guy did at the last step and just repeat that. That takes one state, basically. Right? But counting to 1,000 requires some effort. Right? Now, um, and, and so the if there's a cost to computation, then the best response to tit-for-tat is tit-for-tat. So in fact, both players playing tit-for-tat is an equilibrium if you have a cost for computation. Indeed, if you have a cost for computation and I don't, you should still play tit-for-tat and let me defect at the last step. Right? I mean, what you lose, you're still way better off than, than, than both of us defecting. It's still an equilibrium. So this is actually testable. I'm not by me, because I mean, but, but uh, I mean, the idea, you know, you might ask, suppose you were going to play Prisoner's Dilemma. Would there be a difference? I mean, the naive experiment, which is a bad experiment, would be something like if there were a counter ticking down. And so you could see there are five steps left to go, four steps left to go, and so on. Um, 
would that make a difference? As opposed to a situation where there was no counter. Now that's a bad experiment because having the counter makes the number of rounds salient and, and so you might not have been thinking of the number of rounds and having the counter will make you think of it. So, but it would seem to me that a good experimentalist might be able to come up with an experiment to distinguish a situation with where you had, where you didn't have to compute when the last round was from one where you did, right, without making the round salient. Let me make one other point and then I'll quit. So in general, in our computational framework, Nash equilibrium might not exist. Uh, let me give you a counterexample, which is cute. So the game of rock, paper, scissors, sometimes called Rochambeau, right? So you, does anybody not know rock, paper, scissors? Right, paper beats rock, rock beats scissors, Oops, rock beats scissors and scissors beat paper, right? Um, so there is a unique equilibrium in standard game theory where you randomize one third, one third, one third, right? Um, but I'm going to do rock, paper, scissors where I'm going to charge you for randomizing. So my complexity function says, okay, if you use a, a deterministic strategy, that's free. If you use a randomized strategy, I'm going to charge you epsilon. I don't care what epsilon is. Epsilon is greater than zero. So your payoff, so let's say you get a payoff of one if you win, negative one if you lose, and zero if you tie, minus epsilon if you choose a randomized strategy. So if you randomize, you get one minus epsilon. If you win, and, and negative epsilon if you lose, and so on. Are, are we together? You're choosing a Turing machine. I'm assuming the Turing machine um, has as part of, I mean, I'm allowing Turing machines that randomize. So you're not randomizing over Turing machines, which I don't allow. I allow, I allow you to choose a Turing machine that randomizes. That's actually an important point. So in, in game theory speak, I allow what are called behavior strategies. I don't allow mixed strategies. Exactly because I want to know whether or not you're randomizing, so I can charge you for it. Um, so I claim that in this game there's no equilibrium. Let me prove it. So the first observation is even in the standard game of rock, paper, scissors, whatever strategy you use, I always have a deterministic best response. And basically whatever strategy you use, even if you randomize, my best response is to play the best response to whatever you're putting the greatest weight on. So if you're randomizing and playing, I don't know, paper with probably a half and rock and scissors with probably a quarter, then because you're placing the greatest weight on paper, my best response is to play scissors, which is the best response to paper. If you do things like paper with probability a half and scissors with probability a half, so they're both equal, then I can just do a best response to either paper or scissors. It doesn't matter. So in particular, if you play one third, one third, one third, no matter what I do is a best response. Anything I play is a best response and gives me, once, once you do one third, one third, one third, I get an, ex an expected payoff of zero no matter what I do. It's easy to check. Um, but in this case where I'm charging for randomizing, not only is there always a deterministic best response, but it's a strict best response, right? So in the standard game where I don't charge for randomizing, if both of us play one third, one third, one third, then that's a Nash equilibrium, but in this case it's not. Any Nash equilibrium must involve both players using deterministic strategies because if I'm not using a deterministic strategy, I can do better by switching to a deterministic strategy, whatever you're doing. But clearly there's no equilibrium in deterministic strategies. That's the end of the proof. So this is a game with no Nash equilibrium. Now you might say, hmm, so what does that say? Well, you might want to look on Amazon. So first of all, let me tell you there are world championships in rock, paper, scissors. I think they've had about nine or 10 of them. You can look this up on the web. Uh, I assure you the world champions do not randomize one third, one third, one third, because that would guarantee them a payoff of zero. Um, there's a book that you can buy on Amazon winning strategies in rock, paper, scissors. Not to say this is repeat of rock, paper, scissors, but nevertheless, if you were talking to an economist, uh, the, the book on winning strategies in rock, paper, scissors would, have a par would be of length one paragraph, and it would say, this is a game with a unique saddle point, one third, one third, one third, that's the Nash equilibrium, go away, it's the game is solved, right? Well, clearly that's not what people do. Um, people do find it hard to randomize, by the way. It's cognitively difficult, so it's not unreasonable to charge for randomization. So, um, let, me start, let me just briefly mention that, 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 that there are deep mathematical results here that involve uh, redefining notions of, of multi-party multi -party protocols that I mentioned in the last part of the talk, game theoretically, um, and it turns out to give us, a, you know, we can prove an equivalence result and show that, that, that there is a, a game theoretic version of multi-party security, um, and, and using that, we believe we should be able to get some interesting insights in, in, into cryptography and security, but let me not mention that. Given the time, let me also say that I won't talk about lack of awareness, but get me afterwards, get me over lunch, and I'm happy to say um, 
more than aware. So let me just conclude. So I've suggested, well, I've suggested solution concepts for dealing with fault tolerance and computation. I haven't suggested anything dealing with lack of awareness, but I could. Um, let me just mention a few other things that I haven't talked about, again, all motivated by computer science concerns. So in computer science, when we're looking at things like Byzantine agreement, we assume that there are good guys and bad guys. The bad guys can do anything they like. They can lie and cheat and steal. The good guys are presumed to follow the protocol. Again, these are dumb computers, so I'm the system designer. I'm writing a protocol. I'm assuming that the good guys are, are doing what they're supposed to do. Now, I've allowed for, if you like, bad guys by allowing irrational players. I haven't allowed for good guys, but it seems to me quite reasonable in the game theoretic context to allow for them. For example, I might say, look, if you have large jobs, you have a choice of setting the priority of your job on the printer. If you have a large job, give it low priority. Be nice. And, and you know, let the people who, who have really important jobs, let them put on high priority so that they'll get them done faster. Most people are pretty nice. Now, suppose this is totally anonymous. So, of course, if you're not nice, people sort of start governing at you because they know it was you. But imagine a situation where, where you're part of a large firm and jobs are anonymous. So if you give a job high priority, nobody knows. Nobody knows it's you, right? Um, nevertheless, I think people, by and large, are pretty nice, provided they assume that most other people are being nice and they're not being taken advantage of. That's the intuition I want to capture, that I want to allow for a certain number of nice players, but they're only nice as long as most other people are nice, right? And we get, we, we see this phenomenon in, 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 phenomenon in, in, in real society is that we see this cultural breakdown where once people start to believe that nobody's paying their taxes, well, I'm not going to pay my taxes, think Italy, right? It's not that everybody pays their taxes in the United States, but by and large, you get much better tax compliance in the United States than you do in Italy. And, 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 and partly began in Greece, partly because there's the sense in Italy, nobody else does it, why should I do it? I claim there's some interesting game theory going on here that, that, that needs to be captured, and, and so that there is this notion that there are good guys as well as bad guys. Can we capture that in some reasonable solution concept? There has been preliminary work by Lorenzo Alvisi and his co colleagues. I'm not happy with their approach, but at least it's an attempt. Um, I think it makes sense to think about known deviations in certain contexts. So I have a paper where we look at script systems, which are games with virtual money. And in such systems, even though it's irrational, there's no benefit to stuffing money under your mattress. Real people do. We have hoarders. Uh, this is, if you like, a known irrationality. So rather than allowing arbitrary irrational behavior, can we sort of study games where there are certain understood kinds of irrational behavior? Uh, switching gears in distributed computing, there's a lot of work on asynchrony. We, you know, the default assumption is that a system is asynchronous. There's no clock ticking in the background. The default assumption in game theory, um, implicit because it's never made explicit, is that the system is synchronous. We all go in rounds. There's round one, round two, round three. But hey, wait a minute. Where's the clock coming from? In real markets, real markets are asynchronous. There's no clock. It's well known in distributed computing that asynchrony can have a major impact in algorithms. Lots of things are, can be done in the synchronous setting that can't be done in the asynchronous setting. All the results that I proved on implementing mediators assume synchrony. It seems much harder to get results like that in the asynchronous setting, and I don't think the, the bounds are going to be correct in the asynchronous setting. So I think more generally, it would be good if, if game theorists thought about issues like asynchrony. Um, it's a big deal in computer science. I talked about equilibria with, with, with computation. I was looking at Bayesian games. Uh, game theorists also look at what are called extensive form games. Think about game trees. There you can imagine the computation is going on during the game. That should change things a lot. I haven't quite understood how, but we're working on it. So I think there are lots of other issues. I've just barely scratched the surface. I think the, the one message I want you to take from this talk is that there's a bunch of computer science concerns that make perfect sense in the context of game theory. Uh, they lead to quite interesting technical questions, and I think lead to questions that, that make a lot of sense if you think about real-world settings of, of playing games. And with that, let me stop so we can have lunch.